My name is Nick. This is my wife, Veronica. We're welcoming you to the New York City Church of Christ this morning, the Bronx region. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. I uh, hope that everyone's having a great summer. I hope that the kids have been having a great summer camp experience, enjoying the time, the weather. Everyone's been staying cool. Uh, and and uh, as we prepare to transition back to school for all the families, students, teachers. Uh, so we're going to continue this morning with Maurice preaching about the breaking of bread and about praying together. Uh, so we pray that the service goes really well and that everyone's encouraged by it and enlightened by it. Uh, but before we get into that, we're gonna go ahead and share a scripture with you. Good morning, my name is Veronica. Um, we're gonna go to Acts 2, 46. It says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Um, so we want to make sure that even though during this time that we're meeting online, um, that we still are able to meet together in each other's homes and have fellowship with one another. As um, you can see this morning, we're in the French Ramoides house and they have invited us to break bread with them this morning. So we want to make sure that we continue that um, to have church in our homes, even though, you know, we are meeting online. Let's pray. God, thank you for um, giving us the ability to all be here together this morning, uh, whether who is with each other in person or whether we're together in spirit, you know, in our thoughts and prayers. We pray that uh, we have a great time of worship with the music and, and the fellowship and that also Maurice's preaching be enlightening and encouraging for every one of us. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, how you doing, church family? My name is Hector Reyes, and today I have the pleasure of sharing the contribution message uh, with you guys today. To simple, you know, to simplify contribution to me has always been like just to give what God has given me, right? Like God gave me this job, God gave me this income. Um, you know, how can I give back, or you know, what ways can I give back? You know, with this income. Um, but during the pandemic, I'll be honest with you guys, like it's been kind of tough to give, you know, without that security or without that, you know, without job security or, um, in, um, or income security. It's been kind of hard to give. And it's been, and I've been looking at it more as a, as a light bill per se, right? Like I have to pay this or like, you know, if I don't pay this, like, you know, the lights will turn on. Or if, you know, if I don't pay this, then, you know, um, God won't hear my prayers or something like that. You know, um, and, you know, that's not the way, that's not the way we should give in our hearts. And that's not the way that God, you know, doesn't want us to give. If you guys could just turn over to 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, which reads, Each one of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. You should not give if it makes you unhappy or if you feel, or if you feel forced to give. God loves those who are happy to give. On another version, it'll say, you know, um, God loves a cheerful giver. So after reading the scripture, right, I always it always brings me back to like, you know, to, to like a level-headed space where it's like, all right, you know, I'm going to just simplify. I'm going to just give God what I believe God's given me, you know, and it doesn't matter, you know, the amount, how much or how low, you know, it's just a way for me just to give back, you know, what I've decided in my heart to give back. Um, let me pray. Good morning, Father in heaven. Thank you for this brand new day, Lord. Thank you for just, you know, giving us opportunity just to be here, Father in heaven, reunited, just to hear your word, Lord. Uh, I just want to pray for the rest of the service, Father in heaven, that you could just be with the rest of the speakers, Lord, and that you could just, you know, allow us just to have a cheerful heart, Father in heaven, and 
that you know that you look you know that scripture reminds us that you love someone who just gives cheerfully father you know? i just want to pray for the ones you know for the service once again father in heaven and that you may be with us all lord in the name of jesus i pray amen in stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Oh, when I see many searching for answers, far and wide, but I Searching for answers, only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am.
Welcome to the Bronx region of the New York City Church of Christ. We're glad you're able to join us here today as we continue studying the church in the book of Acts. You know, our first lesson was given by Sam Lee, and he talked to us about being devoted to the apostles' teaching. Then Tony King taught us about the very thing of being devoted to the fellowship. Today, we're going to focus on being devoted to the breaking of bread. And this is important because it's not just let's take communion. It's a lot more than just taking a ritual, a tradition, to really understand what is breaking a bread. What did it mean to Jesus? What does it mean for us today? What does it mean for those that are seeking God? This is an important, important lesson for us to learn. So as we begin, I want to share something with us. On July 4th, 1848, a cornerstone was laid for the Washington Monument. It was made of pure white marble, weighing 24,500 pounds. And it had been seen being dragged from the train station all the way to the site of where the Washington Monument would be made. And there, it was a dramatic thing. Over 20,000 plus people were there. The president at the time, James Polk, he led the parade, followed by his cabinet, followed by other members of Congress. Once they got to the spot, the Speaker of the House gave a two-hour speech. And then they had a time capsule that they filled with several important documents. They had a copy of the Declaration of Independence. They had a picture of George Washington. They had a, a copies of the Constitution. They had an American flag, U.S. coins. They had a multiple things inside this capsule. And this was something that they would treasure, that they would look at years down the road and say this is what occurred on this day in 1848. But yet, something happened. Somehow, they lost the cornerstone. Now, it is believed that it was actually buried. As they were started building the monument, they built over the cornerstone instead of letting the cornerstone be the guiding direction for where they were gonna go. Now, you would think something this important, how could you miss that? How could you miss the fact of something this important being overlooked? We can't look down on them because sometimes we do the very same thing. We have things that are very important to us, but yet we overlook it. In Acts chapter 2, look at what it says in verse 42. Acts 2, 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And this is how the early Christian church worshipped. The apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They were devoted to these things. It wasn't just something that they thought, hey, this is a good idea. Let's do it today. No, it was something that they were devoted to. It was important to them. It was a major, highly valued in their eyes. And Jesus established his supper, the Lord's Supper, on the very night that he was to be betrayed. He gathered his disciples around him as they came together for the Passover. And the Passover was a very important holiday that was celebrated during that time. So God had a lot of uh, Mosaic imagery going on around the Passover. Look at what it says in Matthew 26, verse 26. Matthew 26, verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. See, this meal, which became the foundation of the Lord's Supper, was important enough to Jesus that it was the last thing that he did with his disciples. He was arrested, put on trial, and then crucified. But the last thing he did with his disciples was to have this Lord's Supper. Now you might say, Jesus intended this meal to be the cornerstone for the church. 
See, communion isn't just something that, hey, let's just do it. It was the cornerstone for the church. The last thing they could remember as being together with the group and with Jesus. You know, it talks about it. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Again, it tells us that it was important for the early Christians because they were devoted to this. In Acts chapter 20, it explains that it was the main reason why the church gathered. And then in Acts 20, verse 7, it says, On the first day of the week, they came together to break bread. See, communion was the cornerstone for the church. It wasn't just something that they threw in there to worship. It was the cornerstone of the church. And yet, just like the cornerstone for the Washington Monument was buried over, we can bury over communion, the breaking of bread. It can just be something that's thrown in there, something that we just do and, and don't really focus on or think about. It could be something that is highly valuable, but yet we bury it under so many other things. Let me tell you a story about a couple who of high school students that volunteered to take communion to a group of people at a nursing home. So they themselves stopped at the nursing home, and when they got there, uh, the member of the church, he was in and out. He wasn't really there. He was there, but he wasn't really there consciously. So they didn't know what to do. They were confused. What do we do at this point? So then they decided, well, let's just give them the communion. So they took the cup, and they put it to his lips, and they poured it in his mouth, and he drank it. Then he put a piece of bread on his lip, and he had it on his lip, and then they were just excited, and then they just walked away. Now, they felt good about themselves because in their mind, they gave this member communion. Even though he couldn't remember drinking the cup, he couldn't remember eating the bread, to them, these students, they had done the right thing because they took communion there. And all it was about was drink this and eat this and not really about being devoted to understanding communion and what it's all about. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, in the King James Version says this. It says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? See, they understood that the communion was the blood of Christ and the body of Christ. It wasn't just something that you just did and felt good and just moved on. See, we have to be careful of that because if we just go through the motions of communion, we can also ourselves bury the meaning of communion. See, it's not just something that we go through the motions about, but we have to understand what we're doing right now, the communion, the breaking of bread, being devoted to it, was so important to Jesus that he made it the last thing he did with his disciples. So the memory that they had would be one of having breaking bread, communion with him. So he tells us this is very highly valuable. Do not cover over this. Do not miss the meaning. Do not lose sight of what it is. You know, the word communion in the Greek is koinonia, which literally means fellowship, a very close fellowship. Not just, hey, buddy, what's going on? Deuces. No, a closeness, a close Fellowship together. It's the kind of fellowship that good friends would do together. Close friends would have together. Let me share this with you here. Communion was called the breaking of bread in the New Testament. Nowadays, you can just go down to the store, the bodega, and you can pick up a loaf of sliced bread. But sliced bread wasn't invented until 1928. Now, before that, if you wanted to share your bread with someone, you'd have to get a knife and you'd have to cut it up. But it was just quicker and easier just to tear it, just to break your bread. Now, breaking your bread, breaking your loaf of bread with someone meant that you were sharing your food with them. You were sharing a part of who you are. You were sharing yourself with someone else. That means they are important. They are valuable to you. And you know who else says you're valuable to them? Jesus said this very thing. Let's look at Mark chapter 14, verse 22. Mark 14, verse 22. This is what he says. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, 
take it and eat. This is my body. See, every time you take communion, Jesus is sharing something valuable with you. He's offering his broken body to you. And this makes this critical time of worship so much more special because it's the time that you are closest to Jesus that you will ever be. So you got to realize this. When we come to church, some people, as they hear the music and they, they feel it and they get into it, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But you're closer to Jesus at communion than you are singing worshipful songs. Some people hear the sermon, the preacher's preaching, and they're preaching the word, and they're getting excited, getting you excited, and you're all fired up. But you know what? You're still not as close to Jesus as you are during communion. Communion is the time that you are the closest to Jesus. Not just worshiping the song, not just worshiping through the word. It's the time that you are closest to Jesus. See, don't bury the Lord's Supper by making it just a tradition, a mere ritual. It's way more than that. It's the time that you connect with Jesus. Another thing, whose supper is it? Now you gotta think about this. To whom does communion belong? Well, I know we're all gonna say it belongs to Jesus, right? But sometimes we don't act like it belongs to Jesus. See, this is the Lord's supper. It's not the church's supper. It's not the Bronx region supper. No, this is the Lord's supper. It belongs to the Lord, not to you, not to me. This is the Lord's supper. Look at what it says. First Corinthians chapter 11. It says, when you come together, is it not the Lord's supper that you eat? It's the Lord's supper. Again, we have to understand who does this belong to? The breaking of bread, being devoted to it. It belongs to the Lord. It is the Lord's Supper, the Lord's breaking of bread, the Lord's communion. Let me show you an illustration. Florida college student by the name of Webster Cook was attending a Catholic mass at church on campus. And while he was there, he received the Eucharist, a smaller wafer blessed by the priest. And so at this time, Cook had gone to church with a friend who apparently was not Catholic. And Cook wanted to show his friend uh, the wafer that was given to him. So instead of eating it at that time, right there, he took it back to his seat with him. But on his way back to the seat, people came up to stop him from taking the wafer back to show his friend what it was. Cook had, had planned on just eating it as soon as he got there, but he wanted to show his friend, who was not Catholic, what the wafer was and talk to him what it was about. But yet he was stopped because they felt like what he was doing was wrong. They physically restrained him from taking the wafer from the location of the priest back to his friend to show him because what he was doing was wrong. Now, the thing about it is that the church responded to him by saying this. They pointed out that Cook was holding the wafer hostage. Is that not incredible? They were upset because they felt like they saw him as holding the wafer hostage. Now, why would they think something like that? I mean, that just doesn't make much sense. But here's why. Because they owned the wafer. It belonged to them. It wasn't about Jesus. It wasn't about Jesus uh, last supper. It wasn't about Jesus breaking bread. That wafer belonged to the priest and everybody else there at that church. So for him to take that wafer with him, he took it hostage. It upset them. They weren't going to let that happen. See, all of a sudden, something so valuable as communion can be buried with tradition, can be buried with personal feeling, can be buried in things that aren't righteous whatsoever. And this is where we got to make sure that we ourselves are not doing things out of tradition, but that we're doing it because of our heart. Now, again, there are all kinds of churches who do communion in different ways. But there are some that do it because of different ungodly reasons. There are some churches that take communion only on Sunday night because they feel like unless you are a truly devoted member and you're going to be there Sunday night, then you don't get to take communion. It is crazy the kind of things that are out there, but it's true. It's out there. And this is something that we got to make sure we guard our hearts from 
and that we are not burying the true commitment to the breaking of bread that God calls for us to have. Now, there's something called the closed communion. Now, what it is is this. In the 1800s, there were a certain denomination that had all of its new members take a test. If they passed the test, then they were allowed to take communion. Now, they did this because they felt like only those that were in good standing could take communion. That's why they called it a closed communion. Now, why would they do something like this? Because the communion table was their table. It was their church's table. It wasn't the Lord's table. It was their table. So they wanted to control who took it, when they took it, how they took it. This was their focus. This is ours, and you must do it our way. Now, why would they do that again? Because it did not belong to Jesus. It was their communion. Now, let me, hear, let me, let me explain this to you here. Think about this. At the Last Supper, Jesus was there with all of his disciples, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, James. All those guys were together, but Judas was also there. Now, we know Judas was the one that was going to betray Jesus, but yet think about this. Do you think if Peter knew that Judas was the one that was going to betray Jesus, that he would let Judas take part in that communion? I mean, this is Peter. He was the one that was a self-proclaimed protector of Jesus. Now, do you think if he knew Judas' intentions, he would say, sure, take a piece of this bread. Sure, there's no way he would have done something like that. But why did it happen? Why was Judas sitting there at the table? Because it wasn't Peter's table. It was Jesus' table. It was Jesus' supper. And Jesus did not have those kind of resentments towards people, even though he knew their heart, knew his intentions, knew what he was going to do. He still allowed him to sit at the table and take the supper with him. Jesus broke the bread and said, listen, Judas, I know what you're going to do, but here, still take this bread. This is my body. Take this cup. This is my blood. Why? Because it was Jesus table. Now I say this because many times we get caught up in trying to determine who should take it and who shouldn't take it. But this is so important for us to see that Jesus at his last supper, his breaking of bread, that he welcomed even Judas to partake in his life also. This is something that we need to focus on. Because sometimes we can be so inclusive and, and have all these thoughts and think, well, I had a bad day, so I, Jesus doesn't want me to take communion. If Jesus wanted Judas, the man who's going to betray him, to take communion, how much more should we realize he allows us? We're sinful too, but he allows us to break bread and take communion with him also. We have to remember it's Jesus' communion, Jesus' table. Sometimes we act like it's ours, and we say, I'm not worthy enough to take it. I had a bad day. I missed a quiet time. I got into an argument with my wife. I, I wasn't doing well in school. We have all these reasons that we create for why we can't be breaking the bread with Jesus. Because again, that is the closest you're going to get to Jesus during the Lord's Supper. That's why it's so important for us to understand this and not think it's just a, a tradition that we do. Guys, we, we can't become hypocrites and Pharisees and decide who takes it or who doesn't take it. And sometimes we are the hardest critic on ourselves and saying, I, I don't deserve to take it right now. And Jesus is saying, wait a minute, I'm the one that died for you. How can you decide when you're not worthy to take it? Guys, we got to understand we need to be devoted to the breaking of bread. And when we're devoted to it, then we know we can go to it when we're having our best spiritual times or things are just okay. Or even if you're at your worst, you still need to be devoted to the breaking of bread. Why? Because it's not yours. It's Jesus. It's Jesus' table. It's Jesus' supper. Go to it. Be with Jesus. Get yourself straight. Get your mind on right. Get your self-confidence back and do what Jesus calls for you to do. This is why it's important to be devoted to the breaking of bread. Now, lastly, let me say this. 
The Lord's Supper is the central focus of the worship of the church. The Lord's Supper is the central focus of the worship of the church. Now, it's a time when Jesus wants to connect with you. Now, I'm going to be honest with you here. Some of us are, are programmed and trained to think we need to go to church. We have two songs. We have a welcome. We have a communion. We have a contribution. I mean, we got it all lined up. And if for one reason, something doesn't go in that pattern, maybe we have three songs one Sunday or just one song. Oh, my goodness. What's going on? Uh -oh, what's going on? Is this not going to be good? I can't focus on communion because we didn't have enough songs. We get so whacked out. When we don't follow a system, guys, you are totally missing being devoted to the apostles teaching, the fellowship, breaking the bread and the prayer. That is not how the first century Christians worship. They were so focused. They were just eagerly waiting for that communion to learn, to spend that time a little closer with Jesus. And this is what we have to do. You and I have to do. Don't get caught up in how things may change and how we're doing something, but get caught up in communion because that's the closest time you're going to be to Jesus is during that communion. Now, I want to say this to us here because, again, some churches think that way because that's how they've been taught for so long and it's hard for them to get out of that rut. But the Lord's Supper is something that you and I need to participate in because it's the Lord's Supper. It's not Maurice's Supper. Not your supper, it's the Lord's Supper. Now, you know, there are some congregations that are seeker-sensitive congregations. In other words, they don't talk about communion, the Lord's Supper, on Sundays. Because that has to deal with death, and death is kind of a bummer, it's kind of sad. So we'll put that off till Wednesday and talk about it then. On Sunday, let's just make sure everybody's happy. And see, that's our, those are the churches that are seeker-sensitive. In other words, they want to embrace you into the worship instead of the Word of God and the connection with Jesus. And see, that's what can happen if we're just focused on worship experience instead of worship at heart connecting with Jesus. Now, they try to create an atmosphere that just is a feel-good atmosphere. But what we got to understand is that Jesus wants us to connect with him. And he wants us to understand that communion can sometimes be uncomfortable. I don't think the cross was very comfortable for him. But we have to understand communion can be a time that draws us closer to Jesus than any other time. And so sometimes churches bury communion because they're afraid of what people are going to think or feel in their time of worship. In other words, they take the cornerstone of worship, communion, the breaking of bread, and they bury it in there so people could feel good. See, there's a problem because you cannot bury the cornerstone and think you're going to have a solid structure. It doesn't work like that. And we have to understand, this is what it says, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. It says, for whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, we have to understand, you see, on any given Sunday, on any given week, the singing can be off. The preacher can be off. The fellowship can be a little weird. But there's never a time that the breaking of bread will be off because Jesus is always on time. Jesus is always there. He's always ready. He's always perfect. Always 100% because we have that time with him during the breaking of bread. We can never go wrong. I want us to think about this because I want us to focus on this. We can bury the breaking of bread. Some people come to church late. We have communion and they just come later after communion. They're come, you're missing the whole point of it. You're missing the best part of church, your connection with Jesus. You got to ask yourself, why? Why would I miss the connection with Jesus? Am I going there just to sing? Am I going there just to hear the preaching? Or am I going there to connect with Jesus? This is what being devoted to the breaking of bread is all about. 
is being devoted to having our connection with Jesus every single Sunday. Now, as we come together here online, we got a chance to have this opportunity to break bread together still, even though we're in different homes. Maybe your, your, your Bible study group is together or you're in the park or something. This is still an important time for us to be together. You know, there are some people who, are, who can't get out the house or some elderly people, or maybe bedridden, we still can go have communion with them. But it's not just give them a drink and give them a, a piece of bread. No, it's simply let's connect. I'm giving a piece of myself to you. I'm letting my fellowship, my life be a part, a connection with your life. It is so important for us to be devoted to the breaking of bread. The first century, first century Christians were, you and I need to be today. Now, I'm going to pray for the bread and the cup right now. And after this, we're going to have communion, even though we may be in different locations, but we can still do it together in one in heart and spirit. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for allowing us to just have time to talk about being devoted to the breaking of bread. Thank you for this opportunity to be able to worship together. Even though we may be in different places and locations, still, the Spirit is connecting us together. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for watching your son die. And Jesus, thank you for dying for us. We love you. We appreciate it. Please, Father, bless this bread and this cup. In Jesus' name, amen.
Precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Church. My name is Gerard Towns, and I'll be sharing this week's announcements. Before doing so, we want to give a big thanks to Mo for his inspirational and encouraging message on being devoted to the breaking of bread and prayer. Now the announcements. This week's mid meet will be for men, and it will take place on Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. on Zoom. On Friday, August 26th, the Latin ministry will be hosting a regional married workshop and a local singles devotional, both at 7.30 p.m. on Zoom and both in Spanish. We're still in search of a new permanent facility for Sunday worship, so be praying that God opens the doors to a new home for us to worship. And finally, we're going to lift up the King family in prayer. Last week, Jalisa lost her father, and the family is away to attend homegoing services. Let's pray that God provides comfort and strength for the family and healing as they go through this challenging time. Be sure to join us next week right here on YouTube at 11 a.m. for Sunday service. Have a great Sunday afternoon and God bless. We're gonna sing a song called Fill Me Lord. We're gonna start with the women with the sopranos. Fill me Lord with your spirit and make me like a leader who has a strong, a strong army. Fill me my Lord. Let's have the altos join. Fill me, Lord, with your spirit and make me like a leader who has a strong, a strong army. Fill me, my Lord. All right, now, brothers, join in with Lord, I pray. Yeah.
Let's hear just the voices. Sing it out. Oh, Lord, I'm just a man. I'm just a man. Oh, I need your power to guide me. Oh, I need your spirit to guide me. Fill me Come on, let me hear you. Lord, Sing it out. Come on, sing it again. Oh, Lord, fill me, Lord. Oh, Lord, I'm just a man. 